Have you ever wondered how space systems are optimized to maximize mission accomplishment? In this educational aid, we are going to discuss space mission operations. Space mission operations is how we use all or part of a space system to achieve goals. A successful space system must be a complete system. What I mean when I talk about a system in this context is a collection or group of different segments that work together to achieve the mission. Today, space systems are broken into three distinct segments. The space segment is typically the portion of the space system that people think of first. The space segment is the spacecraft. It includes the payload and all of the other subsystems that make up the spacecraft. If you want to know more about subsystems, be sure to check out the subsystems educational aid. The next segment to discuss is the ground segment. Within the ground segment, commands are sent up to the spacecraft with telemetry and payload data being received on the ground. Finally, we have the user segment. The user segment includes equipment and individuals that leverage the data to achieve the mission of the space system. The user segment can sometimes be very large to support a wide group of users, such as the case in a position, navigation, and timing system. In the case of a PNT system, the user segment consists of everyone that uses any device that takes advantage of the PNT signal, like Google Maps, banking industry, and farming. In other instances, the user segment may be quite small. For example, missions dedicated to scientific exploration, where a small group of scientists or astronomers receive data on a portion of the galaxy that is of interest to them. So how do all these different parts work together? Let's use the United States Global Positioning System, also known as GPS, for the example. First, the space segment performs a mission. In the case of GPS, that mission is for each satellite to send a navigation message to the user segment. The user segment is the reason why we do the mission. In the case of GPS, the user enables their GPS device to receive the navigation message, thereby determining their position. The ground segment enables the space segment to perform its mission. For the GPS example, the ground segment sends commands to the bus portion of the satellite in order to keep all of its systems working to include its position in orbit. The ground segment also creates updates to the navigation message and sends those updates to the GPS constellation, ensuring the GPS satellites are sending out the most accurate signal to the users on the ground. So now you see how each segment is essential. For example, if we only had the space segment, then we would only have a very expensive piece of space junk. Now that we know fundamentally what a space system is, it's time to dig into the details a bit so we could better understand how the system will be used. This will enable a better understanding of the components of each segment. The best place to start is with a concept of operations, or a CONOPS. The CONOPS is a verbal or visual depiction of how the system will be used. A good CONOPS will be clear and concise when describing the mission while highlighting any other systems the space system relies upon. It also details each segment to include how the segments work together to conduct the mission. After we have a well-defined system CONOPS, we further refine it by creating the space mission architecture. A space mission architecture is a collection of elements that make a space mission work. It is broken up into six elements. Those elements are mission, spacecraft, orbits and trajectory, launch vehicle, mission operations systems, and communications networks. The most important element of the space mission architecture is the mission. It describes the basic reason for the space system. Simply put, users have a need and the mission fulfills that need. Some examples of space missions are communications, remote sensing, navigation, and scientific exploration. Of course, not every mission needs a space system, 
but in many instances, the high ground of space, coupled with the ability to fly over anywhere on Earth, enables a unique perspective to accomplish a mission. The next element of the space mission architecture is the spacecraft. On the spacecraft, communications are relayed, sensors collect data, and space is explored, depending on the mission. Fundamentally, the spacecraft is what performs the mission and is broken up into two parts, the payload and the bus. Of course, what good is a spacecraft if it is stuck on the ground? It must be launched into space using a launch vehicle. Launch vehicles put our spacecraft into orbit. We'll cover launch vehicles to a greater extent in the launch propulsion and reentry educational aid. One of the first launch vehicle considerations is the desired orbit and associated trajectory. Orbits and trajectories are the next elements of the space mission architecture. Trajectories tell us in what direction we launch our spacecraft and into what orbit. The mission requirements determine the orbit, and the orbit determines the trajectory. If you are curious and want more information, be sure to check out the Orbit's Educational Aid and the Launch, Propulsion, and Reentry Educational Aid. Calculating the proper trajectory in order to achieve the required orbit is a complicated task and requires people with specific skills and knowledge. The talented people that accomplish those tasks fall under the next element of the space mission architecture, the mission operation system. The mission operation system includes all the people, processes, and equipment required to put a spacecraft into orbit and perform the spacecraft mission. It is divided into two areas. First is the ground and flight hardware and software. Both the hardware and software enable command, control, and communication with the spacecraft. The second area is the mission management and operation system, which includes the people and procedures used to operate our spacecraft. Now let's spend a little more time discussing mission operation systems. The mission operation system works by conducting spacecraft operations from a mission control facility while managing the orbit in three parts. First is mission control. Mission control is a facility that mission operations occur in. That is where spacecraft configuration, anomaly detection, and resolution take place. Next is navigation and orbit control. Orbit control maintains the spacecraft in its proper orbit. It keeps the spacecraft oriented where it needs to be in order to meet mission requirements. Navigation is a process of positioning or maneuvering the satellite to get to the proper orbit. Last is spacecraft operations. Spacecraft operations is a process of managing the spacecraft's payload and other systems to meet mission requirements. For space mission operations to function properly and meet the mission objectives, we need the right people using accurate procedures with the connectivity to communicate with the spacecraft and the ground segment. Therefore, the parts of the space mission operations are the operations organization, and the command control and communication system. Operations organization includes the people and procedures used to control the spacecraft and to process the information from the spacecraft and send commands to both the payload and the bus. The command control and communications or C3 system leverages both the hardware and software on the ground and the spacecraft so that the spacecraft can be controlled and process bus and payload data. C3 is critical to tracking, telemetry, and commanding function. And to have a C3, a good communications network, is necessary. But before we can discuss communication networks, it's important to first understand tracking, telemetry, and commanding. Tracking, telemetry, and commanding involves knowing where the satellite is and where it will be. Tracking, the ability to communicate with the spacecraft, receiving bus and payload data to mission control telemetry, and the ability to communicate commands to the spacecraft from mission control via the communication networks. Here are a few more details concerning tracking, telemetry, and commanding. In order to track a satellite, you have to know where to look. Without accessibility to a robust space and ground surveillance network, there would be no way to know where your satellite is or where to look for it. 
In order for a ground site to track a spacecraft, particular information is required. This information is called tier data, meaning time, elevation, azimuth, range, and range rate. If you remember from the classical orbital elements educational aid, time, or rather epoch time, was one of the critical pieces of information given in the two-line element set. This satellite epoch time, when associated with tier data, tells when the data is valid. Next is elevation. Elevation tells the ground site where to point above the ground, so up specifically where above the local horizon to point based on the satellite epoch time. After elevation is azimuth. Azimuth tells the ground site where to point from true north clockwise, so left or right, at satellite epoch time. Next is range. Range is a measured distance from the ground site to the spacecraft, given the elevation and azimuth and epoch time. And the last part of tier is range rate. Range rate is how fast the range is changing. Recall from the orbit types and conservation energy educational aids. The lower the satellite, the faster it is moving. The higher the satellite, the slower it is moving. So depending upon the orbit, range rate can be quite fast for LEO spacecraft and almost zero for GEO spacecraft. Range rate is important for several reasons. First of all, it is essential in determining the Doppler shift necessary to establish radio links. Range rate is also a critical component of determining how long a spacecraft is visible to a ground site and the user on the ground. Once we know where and when to point, we can start to receive telemetry from the spacecraft. Telemetry is nothing more than satellite bus and payload mission data. Mission Control receives telemetry from the spacecraft where satellite operators on the ground monitor status of health from the bus subsystems, such as voltage and temperature and mission data from the payload, ensuring everything is within operational limits and working nominally. Tier data is calculated for a given tracking site from the two-line element set and knowledge of that tracking site's latitude and longitude. The data is transmitted via communications networks, which will be covered shortly. Through the same system, the satellite operators can receive telemetry. Operators task the spacecraft and its subsystems via commanding. Satellite operators will task the satellites for many reasons. Some examples are firing the thrusters to maneuver the spacecraft for station keeping operations, resetting a subsystem due to its operating out of the operational limits, and preparing the batteries to work during eclipse. Some space systems are designed to have different teams operating the bus and the payload, whereas some space systems combine those functions into one group of satellite operators. Now that we understand what is required to track a spacecraft in order to receive telemetry and send commands, we can discuss the communications network required. Communications network are combinations of nodes and links. Nodes are ground stations, control centers, and satellites, whereas links are the secure paths that data travels that connect the nodes. Downlinks going from the satellite to the ground stations uplink from the ground station to the satellite, and forward and return crosslinks when using a relay satellite. Let's look at an example. Operators sitting in mission control need to send a command to the satellite. If mission control is not a ground station, the command will be sent via secure link to the ground station. The ground station using the most current tier data will send the command to the satellite and the satellite communication subsystem receives a command. The spacecraft then will communicate telemetry back to the satellite operators in the reverse path. The telemetry data will communicate if the spacecraft will, is about to, or is unable to perform the command that was received. However, this architecture is a little different if a relay satellite is required. Again, the satellite operator sends a command to the ground station, then from the ground station to the relay satellite. Now, using the crosslink, the satellite will send the command to another relay satellite if the desired satellite is not in view. 
the relay satellite will continue to relay the command until it is sent to the desired satellite. Again, this process is reversed for telemetry. Depending upon the mission concept of operations, the commanding may not use relay satellites, but the payload may require the use of relay satellites. In general, there are two types of communication networks, common user networks and dedicated user networks. Common user networks support multiple missions at the same time, and dedicated user networks typically support a single user community. Examples of a common user network would be NASA's Space Network, supporting deep space and near-Earth missions, and Universal Space Network, which support commercial and scientific missions. Well, that's it for Space Mission Operations. I'm David Toledo with the National Security Space Institute, and I sincerely hope you enjoyed this educational aid.